Yeah, who's heard of Alice in Wonderland? Alice in Wonderland. Is, I think the book might be called Through the Looking Glass. Does that sound right? I don't know. Um, I, I'm not literate per se. Um, Alice in Wonderland, she follows the white rabbit, who's in a big hurry, if you remember correctly, and she follows him down into the rabbit hole, and then when she gets down there, she discovers this land that's very, very strange, and really can't make heads or tails of it. All the creatures act very strange. They have very unusual conversations. She gets terribly frustrated trying to interact with the various uh, people and characters that she interacts with, because nothing seems to make any sense. Uh, and the characters in Wonderland can't seem to understand why she is having such a big problem. What's wrong with celebrating an unbirthday, right? I mean, that sounds fantastic. Uh, and so she can't make heads or tails of it. Uh, the normal rules of interacting with people and the normal wor- rules really of physics don't apply uh, for Alice. Uh, she's upside down in a right side up world or the reverse. It's hard to tell. Or she's right side up in an upside down world and she can't make heads or tails of what's going on in in wonderland and here we find ourselves in a local church the body of jesus christ living in uh, the world around us and i think it would be fair to say that as christians those who depend on christ for salvation who who want to live a life of faith in christ we find ourselves living right side up in an upside down world and sometimes it's hard to make heads or tails of it Honestly, isn't it? Is it? Maybe it's just me, and if it is, oh yeah, I don't have anything else prepared, so you're going to have to roll with me on it. <laughs> yeah, we, we have, we have uh, the Bible, and we have our, our, what God is doing in our hearts, and we have things that we think are priorities and things are important, and the world around us uh, denies them. And so one of the things we consider is we want to look at the, at the Scripture. We want to say, well, if, if we want to live the way God calls us to live, and we want to live according to the kingdom of God in the body of believers, uh, what does it mean to have the, the priorities of the gospel, the priorities of Jesus in the church? That's the title of the message today, if you like titles. Gospel priorities in the church. What does it mean to live right side up, according to the gospel, not according to our own personal preferences or whims, but if we were to take into account the power of Christ to save sinners and the the power of Christ to change people through the gospel, as it says in Romans 1.16, well then what does gospel priorities in the church mean? And the Apostle Paul in today's passage, he outlines a couple of different things. It certainly isn't comprehensive. He doesn't cover everything. But he says, what are some gospel priorities in the church in a couple of different areas? And I'm going to uh, touch on those for you for just briefly here this morning. So gospel priorities in the church. Number one gospel priority in the church that Paul touches on today, uh, if you like to take notes, you can write this down. Elders who point to Jesus. A gospel priority in the church are, are elders who point to Jesus. This is what he says in verse 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching uh, and teaching. The scripture says, do not muzzle the ox, and, uh, and the worker deserves his wages. And he says, there's double honor for the elders uh, who are leading the affairs of the church. And what are the affairs of the church? To make, to make known the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the believer that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus and to the unbeliever that they might put faith in him. And so the work of the elder is to to bring forth the truth of the gospel to all of us all the time, that we might be reminded of what Jesus is doing and what we're called to in believing him. And and he's saying there's double honor for elders who do this. And what does double honor mean? It's really, really complicated. One is respect and and honor, honor and respect. And the other one is is remuneration, getting paid. That's easier to say. And Paul is saying it's not out of line for an elder who preaches and teaches, if necessary, to uh, forego another job that would distract from that primary responsibility that he could receive support uh, from the church, that his needs might be met, that he could focus primarily on preaching and teaching. That doesn't take away from his ministry, nor does it, uh, is it necessary. But, but there is that honor that says, hey, uh, you know, you can be, receive support and payment uh, for ministry of the gospel. And this is what Paul is supposing Uh, In many times in Paul's ministry, there were times that he did not receive payment. When he ministered in the city of Corinth, he on purpose refused to receive payment from them so that he could be uh, freed up 
from feeling obligated to them. But then in many other places, he did receive payment so that he could be supported and serve while being undistracted from working uh, on the side. And, and, and a priority of the church is to have elders who point to Jesus, those who direct the affairs of the church and those who teach and esteem Christ for the believers uh, in the body of believers. Now, our culture, how is our culture upside down from that if we're comparing it to Alice in Wonderland? What does our culture look for in those who lead an organization? We, well, we look for dynamic, type A, get them done, knock it out of the park. Uh, super CEOs who can lead an organization to bigger and better and higher and more powerful. And the Bible paints a very different picture of elders. What are elders called to do? Show Jesus to people as much as you can. Well, that's not very dynamic. That's not very powerful. What's, when are we going to make it to the next level? When are we going to make it to a breakthrough? When are we going to be the shining beacon on the hill that other churches will be? Oh, if we were only like FBC. Is that in Paul's priorities? What are Paul's priorities for those who lead in the church, whether it be elders or Sunday school teachers or husbands and, and wives in a home? Show Jesus the good news of the gospel as much as we can. Well, well, what good will that do? How will we build a new annex? How will we have big attendance? How will we have a gigantor budget? I mean, these are all the things Paul points to, right? No, he doesn't. What does he point to? Elders do what? Point to Jesus. What do we do in our homes? What's the primary calling of a father in his home? Show his kids Jesus. Show his wife Jesus. The same goes, holds true for the wife. What's, what's the primary role of a wife in the home? Show her husband Jesus. If you spent the rest of your life showing the people around you Jesus and his love, I don't think you're going to go wrong. You may not achieve many of the goals that this world holds high. You may not achieve many of the accolades that our war, world would seek us to do, but you would very likely achieve precisely what God calls us to. God calls the elders of a church who, especially those who preach and teach, those who show that the word of God demonstrates page and page after page, Jesus saves sinners. He says these are to receive double honor. Our eyes, we want leaders who can impress us and who can inspire us. And the Bible calls us for leaders to be unimpressive to such a degree that we would say, well, we're lucky we have Jesus because these guys, I mean, they're useless. And you think I'm kidding. This is how Paul painted his ministry in 1 Corinthians. He said, I came to you not with power, but I came to you with weakness that you might more readily see the power of Christ and him crucified. In the Old Testament, there was a story where this didn't go well for the people of Israel. They went to Samuel with a genuine request. What they wanted was a king. Do you remember this story? They wanted a king. And at least they didn't uh, hedge any bets. They weren't like, um, sneaky about it. They told Samuel exactly why they wanted a king. Do you remember why they wanted a king? We want to be like the other kingdoms. All the cool kids have kings. Samuel, we want a king. All the cool kids have kings. And so God brought them a king. And what was the description of this king? Tall, dark, and handsome. He was taller than all the other uh, Hebrews by, by a shoulder and a head. His name was Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was strikingly handsome. He was tall and he was handsome. And they said, now that's, that right there is a king. Now how did that work out for them? They didn't have a king that pointed to Jesus. They didn't have a king that pointed them to the good news that God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. They didn't have a king that pointed them to the faithfulness of God. Rather, they had a king that pointed to himself and it was a tragedy. In the same way, a church wouldn't want leaders that simply point to themselves or point to their own service. Rather, we would seek leaders and Sunday school teachers and uh, women's ministry leaders and youth leaders who point people over and over again to Jesus and the power of the gospel. We tend to honor those that earn our accolades and earn our honor, who have done the right things that we decide have deserved accolades and the Bible does something different. We honor those who point to the one who deserves the accolades. Some of you take road trips this time of year. I think this is July 4th weekend. Uh, so folks, 
travel on, on July 4th weekend, especially when the pr gas prices are relatively low. And uh, so you'll drive down the road, and there are little green signs on the freeway. Have you seen these green signs? And they say, Portland, 282 miles. And your kids, of course, are asking over and over, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? And uh, turn the car around, never. We're going home. <laughs> I'm just wondering, have you ever, on your way to wherever it is, you're driving, driving let's say Disneyland. Let's pick, pick on Disneyland. You're driving to Disneyland. And you pull into Anaheim, and there's the little blue sign installed by the city government that says, Disneyland, next left. Have you ever pulled your car over and got the whole family out by that sign? Oh, that's a beautiful sign. Look at it. The corners are all there. It's perfectly square. The shade of blue really makes the white lettering stand out. It's very easy to read. Come on, let's get a picture. Everybody gather around. Has anybody ever done that? Don't raise your hand if you did. Okay, seriously, that's not something you want to admit to. But this is the problem is we want elders and leaders that we can stand. Look at this great leader. He's so amazing and fantastic. That's not his job. That's not her job. What's their job? To point to the one who is fantastic. And this cult of personality in our culture is, is huge. And it's something where the church is supposed to be upside down. Where we don't honor those who are amazing. We honor those who honor the amazing one. And that's what the ministry of, of eldering is called to. Uh, elders who routinely, over and over again, call forth people to look to Jesus. Now, what's going to happen when you have elders who are saying, look at Jesus, he forgives you, he offers grace, he offers mercy, your shame is gone, your guilt is gone. What will happen in that case? Well, you're going to enter the battlefield. You're going to have an enemy who wants to destroy the reputation of those around him, and Paul makes allowance for those who are going to take shots. So look what he says. Uh, he says this, uh, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. So if an elder is really messed up bad, which is normal because elders are humans, they say we should entertain those in fact, but it only should be in the case when there are people who say, you know what, this guy is really blowing it. I would also suggest from other passages of scripture that this is something that's done out of love and mercy and grace with an effort to renew and restore. And we've seen this happen in our church. And so we have here, if, if one person comes in and they want to blow an elder out of the water and make some wild accusation, Paul says, in, uh, I think it's in the original Greek, talk to the hand. Now, if there are several people who want to come forward and say, listen, we know what's going on. It needs to be handled. Then it ought to be handled. There's no room in the body of Christ for sweeping stuff under the rug. We're going to call a spade a spade, and we, we can do that because Jesus died for sin, so we can do that boldly and without fear. But we must understand, elders put themselves at great spiritual peril. Your Bible teachers put themselves at great spiritual peril. Uh, the last time you were in a Bible study or a, a, a teacher or at a church, you must understand the night before for that teacher, it's probably like it is for most Bible teachers, a swirling doubts and convictions and fear and insecurity, and not only that, all the sin they're working through. Yes, it turns out elders and preachers and teachers work through sin. Because we're not in heaven yet. And these are things that, that, that teachers and uh, preachers and elders are facing. He's calling the body of believers. Listen, they're under fire already. Let's not bring them under friendly fire. Now, if they deserve to, to be called onto the carpet for their choices, then let's do it, but let's do it the right way. And as two or three people coming forward and say, this is what's going on, we need to address it. And if an elder is caught up in sin, in his public office, his sin is to be addressed publicly. And boy, isn't that a lot of fun, right? You may not like it, but this is how we live in, a, in the right side up world. What shame is there in declaring sin out loud in the body of Christ? Well, there's some embarrassment, right? We're, on Sunday mornings, we don't have you come up and write your list of sins on the wall. That'd be embarrassing. But what happens to our sin? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, where's your sin today? I love the one verse it's at the bottom of the ocean. If you want to get it, go ahead. It's as far away from God as it can possibly be, and it's as far away from us. So we can handle and address sin in our midst, even in our own life, without guilt, without shame, because we have a Savior that provided forgiveness. Gospel priorities in the church. Number one, elders who point to Jesus. Gospel priorities in the church, elders who point to Jesus. All right, moving along. Second thing here, 
gospel priorities in the church. We're going to go through this in fairly quick fashion. So if I start talking real fast, it's the four cups of coffee I had this morning. Gospel priorities in the church, seeing people like Jesus. Gospel priorities in the church, seeing people like Jesus. Verse 21, just to remind you, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the angels, keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Now, what could happen if Timothy comes to an elder with a couple other guys and say, hey, listen, Elder Tom, we know what's going on, and we need to handle some business. And Elder says, hey, I give a lot. I'm pretty important in this community. You, uh, you give me any trouble, there's going to be trouble for you. Right? And this is the human condition. You say, well, we would never do that. No, this is called being human. We look at people and we honor them and say, well, we don't want to, we don't rock, want to rock the boat. Here's a, here's a heavy hitter. This is a guy that matters and he's important and he's significant. I brag to my friends that so-and-so goes, goes to my church and come on, let's just let's handle it privately. He can deal with his stuff, right? I mean, that's the temptation, isn't it? And, and Paul says to Timothy, no, we, we see people like Jesus sees people. Is there a difference between the big shot and the not big shot in the Bible? The answer is no. Is there a difference between the head honcho and the not head honcho? And that's a theological term. No, there isn't. Is there a difference between the one who has a, has a great retention for memory and great theological knowledge and the other one who, who, who doesn't do as well in trying to remember facts and theology? Is there a difference between the two? Is there one who a difference between that? One who has great income and one who has less income? One who has a certain kind of family and another one whose family is broken? Is there a difference? No, both need Jesus. And Paul is telling Timothy, a priority in the gospel, a priority in the church is that everyone is seen as needing Jesus. Everyone is seen through the lens of we need a savior. We must not be partial. Something changed significantly in our country in the middle of the last century. Everybody got a TV. And then we had an election, one of the first elections in history, where the presidential candidates were were prominently featured on television. And as one commentator said, that was the end of ugly presidents in the United States. (laughs) I mean, it's funny, right? How terrible is that? There are people that ought to lead us, who we ought to be led by, who have a great face for radio, and we would never elect them. One president, and I won't get into it because I don't want you to get distracted on politics, They say that his election was derailed because he sweated profusely during one of the televised debates. Because this was before they figured out, well, we've got to do all the makeup, it's black and white. And so we were sweating. And so the assumption was he must be nervous. But you know, under the lights and all this, he just sweated. An an election was derailed. I'm not saying whether or not that guy should have been elected. Some of you know who I'm talking about. I'm just saying, all of a sudden now, we are partial. And now I don't even want to get into how elections are changed with social media because everything on Facebook and Twitter is true. If you... <laughs> in the body of Christ, when we know of sin, in loving and caring relationship, with we, we must deal with it. Regardless of the person is a heavy hitter or well-known or important, we have to address sin with the gospel no matter what. No matter what it costs us, no matter how it makes us look. Oh, God forbid that we would think our church reputation is more important than addressing the need of a brother or sister in the Lord to have their sin addressed. Wouldn't it be great if we said, we don't care about our reputation, we're going to help Bill, I apologize to all Bills, this is, I'm making names up, we're going to help Bill deal with his stuff. And we don't care what people think. Because we got Jesus, so I think we're square. I think we're good. We see people like Jesus See people. There is no place for favoritism in the body of Christ ever. There is no place for favoritism in the body of Christ ever. And he touches on this in this last little verse, verse 22. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sin of others. Keep yourself pure. He says, either in addressing sin in the lives of believers around us or in calling people to to do the ministry of God in the local church, he says, look for the work of Christ. Don't be hasty. Look for the work of Christ. 
we're going to call somebody into ministry, it's okay to sit down and say, what's Jesus doing in your heart? And then we're going to, want, we're going to, we're going to look at that and see what that looks like in your life. In addressing sin or calling those into ministry, let's not be hasty, but let's look for the work of Jesus in the life of the individual. Gospel priorities in the church. What's number one? Elders who point to Jesus. What's the number one job of an elder? Be a really good sign. Prayer, teaching, shepherding, uh, training, exhorting, discipling, all those, all those other things come out of being a really good sign of pointing people to Jesus. Why do I want to pray for people? I want them to find Jesus. Why would I disciple someone? Because Jesus is found in the Bible. Why would I exhort you to obedience? Because Jesus is most profoundly experienced in living according to his ways. Elders who point people to Jesus. Second priority in the church, according to the gospel, seeing people like Jesus. Last little bit here. Look with me down at verse 23. I'm going to read it again just to remind you of the verses. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. Gospel priorities in the church. Life resting in Jesus. Gospel priorities in the church Life resting in Jesus. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, listen, you've got stomach issues. We don't know what Timothy's stomach issues were. And Timothy wasn't taking wine to address his stomach issues, which would have addressed his stomach issues. And we're, wondering, we're left wondering, well, why was Timothy not taking wine to address his stomach issues? And we're left to guess. I think we've got a pretty good educated guess as to why. We have in the Ephesian church the church in Ephesus, a number of problems they're dealing with is people who are following all kinds of different sorts of teaching, and there are some people who are giving commands, you must not get married. Uh, you must not eat certain kinds of food. And we touched on this several weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, and we call this kind of discipline asceticism. Asceticism. And what that simply means is I express my faith by deciding what I'm not going to do. I love God, so I'm not going to drive a car. I'm going to ride a bike. I love God, so uh, I'm not going to eat bacon. I don't like that one. Um, <laughs> I think about it. I love God, so I'm not going to watch TV. I love God, so I'm not going to use electricity on Sundays. I, I stayed in a home one time on a, a choir trip I was on years, 100 years ago, and yet, sure enough, Sunday morning, they'd, they don't use electricity in the kitchen. So if they wanted something cooked, they cooked it the night before. I didn't totally understand it, but that, that was their deal. So what they have said is, if, is, is if, if you want to follow God and know God, well, then you ought not to eat certain kinds of food, and you shouldn't get married. you got to stop doing that stuff. And Timothy here, all of a sudden we just find out, what is he not doing? He's not drinking. He's not drinking alcohol because he's uh, concerned about, well, these people are so religious and spiritual. I don't want to be seen. Uh, you know, that shouldn't be happening. And he's actually doing this to the detriment of his own health. He's not even, even though it could address the stomach uh, ailment. And Paul is saying, listen, Timothy, get over yourself. Is Jesus handling your business or what? Are you worried about what people are thinking in the Ephesian church because they're not into certain things? Look in our Bible. Does it say to do or not to do? It, then rest in Jesus. Rest in Jesus. And, and, and Timothy, stop it. Quit being silly. You're trying to earn favor with others by what you don't do, and that never works. Let me explain that again in uh, simpler terms. Earning favor by not doing something so others will be impressed will never work. If somebody needs you to measure up on something you don't do, let me give you a hint. You will never measure up. And some of you have gone down, played this game before. You don't, do you? You never feel like you measure up because as soon as you, all right, I got this. I'm not doing that anymore. There's some other rule they hadn't told you about. You want to know how to express love of God through your behavior, look in the Bible. And Paul is saying, Timothy, take some wine for your stomach. 
Quit following this false gospel that you can incur uh, honor and respect from God by some sort of self-discipline that is not found in the scripture. Religious obligation always leads to sin. Religious obligation, this effort to decide what I must do and what I must not do to please God always leads to sin. The reason I say that is in the, it's in the book of Romans. Paul says it this way. I wasn't sure what sin is, and then I read the law. Do not envy. Oh, now I envy. That's how the law works. So religious obligation, which is this long list of things that good Christians do and good Christians don't do, always leads to more sin. The law always condemns. So when I come up with a list of do's and don'ts that good Christians do and don't do, it always leads to me sinning more, and then it always leads to me living in condemnation. Here's what good Christians do. I failed again. And Paul's suggestion to Timothy is, how about this? Rest in Jesus. Move your life into holiness because of the power of God working in you, not some arbitrary list of things that people should or shouldn't do. Religious obligation leads to sin. It leads to condemnation. It wakens the flesh when we decide there's a bunch of things that we should or shouldn't do. It leads us to seeking a Christian life that is based on achievement. And when we think we have achieved something in the spiritual life, it leads to entitlement. And entitlement leads to something like this. Here's what happens. There are some spiritual things I'm really good at. I'm really good at not murdering people. I mean, I've, it's a skill. I literally have not murdered anyone today. No round of applause on that one. Jeez, I think that, I mean, I nailed it. Thank you, Garrett. Appreciate it. So since I haven't murdered anyone, well, I'm kind of hitting down the park on the whole no murder thing. Yeah, good for me. Also, less cleanup. So now I feel like a pretty good Christian. Well, I know I'm married. A conversation with this one individual. That's just a conversation, right? And I'm, I'm hitting it out of the park on the, on the whole don't kill anybody thing. So I can, I can color outside the, little, the lines a little bit of what it looks like to be faithful to my spouse. That's where entitlement goes. It says, oh, no, I've got, I'm, I'm good over here. And so over here I can kind of fudge a little. We call this compartmentalizing. It means if I'm dialed in over here, over here I get to do what I want. God gets uh, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and I get the rest of my day because I, I killed it during the hours that were God's. And so on my hours, I can do whatever I want. And you think I'm being silly. This really happens in your life. We showed up for church Sunday morning. We have to meet in a gym. I mean, God, you owe me. This afternoon, I'm going to watch whatever I want on TV. I don't care if it's good or not. Yeah, this is how religious obligation, it's a form of, of religiosity that seems so spiritual, but at the end of the day, it just leads to more sin. And Paul is writing to Timothy, knock it off. Your ability to make your stomach hurt by not drinking wine is not helping your sin situation. It's not helping your righteousness. How about this? Rest in Jesus. Rest in him and know that he accepts and receives you. Timothy didn't want to offend others. But seeking to not offend others just list, resulted in a list of arbitrary rules, and nobody ever knows what the real list of rules is. Rest in the gospel, not others. To do or not to do something to either please God or the people around you is the opposite of resting in the good news of the gospel of Christ. To do or not to do something, just simply in uh, understanding of the people around you, is the opposite of resting in Jesus. Rest in Christ. He says this, the sin of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others will trail behind them. Here's the thing. Most of the people we're trying to impress, if we knew what was going on, we wouldn't be that impressed. The reverse is true. Most of the people who are trying to impress us, if they knew what was going on in our life, they wouldn't be that impressed. He's saying, listen, there's things going on, and there are many whose sins will find them out. 
And, and the reverse is also true. There are many who are doing profound works of gospel proclamation in the world around them, and we have no idea. And he says, but they don't need to worry about it because they're resting in Jesus, and they will stand with him one day, and he will affirm their work. There is no need for affirmation or condemnation here when we rest in Jesus. Rest. Spiritual vitality is not what people see, but spiritual vitality is found in the hidden places of our heart. Spiritual vitality in your life is not what you present to the people around you. Spiritual vitality is what's going on in your heart. And Paul calls Timothy to that. Stop drinking water. Drink a little wine for your stomach and get over your need to please others. And don't worry about others. Some of them are pretty impressive and they're not that impressive. And some people you're not that impressed with really are. I'm going to close with a story from the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 22. There was a king. He was made king when he was eight years old because his dad, who was king, was assassinated after two years on the throne. His name is Josiah. His grandfather was a king named Manasseh. Manasseh was Manasti. See, now you're going to remember that. Manasseh was the worst. Manasseh was worse than Ahab. And remember, Ahab was one bad dude, right? Manasseh went next level Ahab. And Josiah was Manasseh's grandson. And Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And Josiah loved the Lord. And he had the temple renovated because it needed to be restored. And he had it renovated. And in, during the restoration, he was uh, maybe 18 to 25 years old, somewhere in there. They found the book of the law. They found the Bible. Now, it's funny that no one had a, a copy of the scripture, especially the king who was supposed to receive his own copy of the scripture when he was made king and take an oath at the pillar of the temple affirming he would follow it. And Josiah has been king 18 years. He's never even seen the thing. They bring the book to him and, and they read him this book and he's hearing it for the first time as a young adult. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, this is 2 Kings twenty two eleven, he tore his robes and he gave orders to the priest, go to the prophetess, if she was a lady, and find out what the Lord wants. He heard the word of God and said, we're toast. And he tore his robes, which was a sign of mourning. It was something you would do when you knew you were going to die. And Josiah tore his robes, and he sought the Lord. So they went to the prophet, the prophetess, and this is what she said to them. This is beginning in verse 15 of 2 Kings 22. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, tell Josiah, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they've forsaken me, they've burned incense to other gods, they've provoked me to anger by all their idols... And now my anger will burn against this place and it will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the word you heard. Verse 19, are you ready? Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people and that they have become accursed and laid waste and because you tore robes and you wept in my presence... I have heard you. This won't happen while you're alive. What was God affirming in the life of Josiah? His public ministry of restoration? How later on he rebuilt the temple and got rid of all the high places and the idols? No. What was God affirming? Him and just one or two other advisors freaking out where nobody could see. And that's what God noticed. God points out, Josiah, because you tore your robes when nobody else was watching... When there was no accolades, there was no, boy, Josiah is one spiritual dude. It was just Josiah and the Bible and the Lord, and Josiah was broken by the realities of the situation. God says, I will uh, honor your private faith, your private acknowledgement of worship. His public, action, his public actions in Judah, he had the single greatest reform period in the life of Judah, his public actions were simply him walking out what was already true when he was by himself. 
okay? That's the difference between someone caught up in religious obligation. Josiah just simply in public walked out the thing that was true of him in private. And God affirmed what was going on in his heart in private. When we find our rest in Christ, when we find our rest in the Lord, when we find our rest in him, it works itself out in our public sphere. But the first place it has to occur is in our heart. The first place we have to rest is in our own heart. After that, it will come out in the places around us. When we finally say, Jesus, you take it. Resting in Jesus is not wanting elders and leaders to be like CEOs and our favorite government leaders who can get the job done, go for bigger or go home. Resting in Jesus is not wanting people in our church community to be like us or to do their life like we do it. That's not resting in Jesus or having gospel priorities in the church. Resting in Jesus and having gospel priorities in the church is not having a hypersensitivity to what others think or evaluating others based on their behavior. That's not resting in the good news of Jesus. That's not having gospel priorities. What's the, one last thing about Josiah in verses, verse uh, 25 of 2 Kings 23. Josiah led to great reforms in Judah. He cleared out all of the idols. He cleared out all of the high places. He, uh, he even took out uh, idol, idols that King Solomon had built. You can imagine what that was like. And this is what the Bible says about uh, his heritage. If I can find it. Because I can't. Hold on. Here it is. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did. Hear that? With all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength. What were the first two things? With all his heart, with all his soul, and then finally, with all his strength. In accordance with the law of Moses. But listen to this, verse 26. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the heat of his fierce anger. His anger which burned against Judah because of all that Manasseh had done to provoke him to anger. And so the Lord said, I will remove Judah. What does that tell us about a Josiah? He's a great king who can follow the Lord. He's a lousy Messiah. We need a king who can actually show up and serve the Lord with all his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength, and then when he's done, the anger of the Lord is, in fact, turned away. Anybody ever done that? It's church, the right answer is Jesus. The, the true king of Israel, the true king of the cosmos, has showed up and he served the Lord from minute one of every moment of his life with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength, and at the end of the day, what did God say when he was done? It's finished. The anger of the Lord is turned away. There is no rekindling of it. It's gone. This is the good news where you and I can sit here and have no concern. The anger is gone. We can rest in the gospel. I don't have to get so uptight about the things you do on the weekends. Because his anger is gone. Now because I love you, maybe I need to come to you and talk about what you do on the weekends. But it's not in the spirit of Anger or resentment is the spirit of Jesus loves us and saves us. We can have gospel priorities because we have a Jesus who saves us. And Romans 8, 1 says it best. What does it say? There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no qualifier to that. There's no expiration date. There's no, there's no condemnation as long as you mind your P's and Q's. It's just simply there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He really does rock that much. I don't know another way of saying it that way. He really is that awesome. So in, in light of the good news of Jesus Christ, we can have these priorities where we just look for leaders in our body, whether they be elders or pastors or teachers or Sunday school leaders or Awana club leaders, and we just want people who can point us to Jesus. 
We just want to find leaders who point us to Jesus. We want to see people like Jesus sees them. We don't need the heavy hitters. We don't need the big fancy pants and the influential. Because everybody has the opportunity to be in Christ in faith. We don't need favoritism or looking up to some and not to others because we have Jesus. And finally, we can rest in Jesus because there's no condemnation. I don't need to be, impress you. You don't need to impress me. We don't need to impress other, each other. We've got Jesus. Gospel priorities in the church. Elders who point to Jesus, seeing people like Jesus, and life resting in Jesus. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to have a time of prayer before we sing just one last chorus before we head off to do whatever you're going to do this holiday weekend. But just before we get out and get busy and all that, this is a great time to quiet our hearts and just come before the Lord and see what he's doing. So when we bow our heads and close our eyes, and I'm going to lead in prayer, but in just a minute I'm going to go quiet and let you just pray how the Lord is leading you.